Good morning, and welcome to the Children's National Celebration of World Kidney Day. I'm really excited to be moderating um, this session um, and some great talks by my colleagues from nephrology. It's a very important um, uh, milestone as well because um, in March 2010 uh, of this year, the um, International Society of Nephrology and the International Federation of Kidney Foundations um, sponsored the 11th World Kidney Day. And this year, for the first time, the emphasis was on um, children and um, diseases that start in childhood and are antecedents of adult disease. And um, there was a really lovely editorial in Pediatric Nephrology talking about the importance of kidney disease in child health. And as you might imagine, um, the um, disparity that occurs across the world uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think that one of the things that was really lovely from this um, particular piece that was um, uh, co-authored by Julie Inglefinger, who is a pediatric nephrologist and the deputy editor of the New England Journal, um, and a very literate woman, um, this uh, quote from John Conley from the Book of Lost Things, that for in every adult there dwells a child that was, and in every child there lies the adult that will be. And I think we as um, pediatricians, um, we as academic pediatricians, really know this well. We are at the start of the lifespan and how it plays out and the consequences that occur, not just during childhood, but the things that are set up for adulthood, obviously are things that we're very, very mindful of. And this is particularly true um, in kidney disease. I want to just set the stage for the talks this morning by um, taking this figure, which actually was from this editorial, talking about the types and risk of kidney disease across the life cycle. So unlike in adults, where glomerul uh, glomerulopathies and, um, and the consequences of diseases like diabetes are the major cause of kidney disease, most children um, who have kidney disease have either a congenital disorder like a cystic disease um, uh, uh, or a cystic dysplasia or an inherited disorder um, of the kidney. Children also can be subject to acute kidney injury, which can set them up in later life to develop hypertension, um, uh, proteinuria, and even chronic kidney disease. And so um, as, you, as you move along the lifespan, the contribution of nephron number, in other words, the number of nephrons that you're born with, becomes actually increasingly important. And so in the course of um, the hour today, we're going to have three really wonderful talks. I know, because I previewed them. Um, and nephron Endowment in Health and Disease by Dr. Larry Patterson, Acute Kidney Injury by uh, Dr. Kritita Mystery, and Hypertension in um, Children by Dr. Sunyan An. And then we'll close this session with a um, summary and a question and answer um, period uh, by Dr. Shamir Tuckman. So I, I, I think you're in for a great learning experience. Kidney disease is, seems to be a somewhat well-kept secret uh, among academics, and this morning you will be enlightened. So let me ask uh, Dr. Patterson to come to the podium for give his talk. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, so, the focus of my talk will be on nephron endowment, but I wanted to try to place that in a proper context by first reviewing a couple things. So, I, first I wanted to review the, um, probably the leading theory um, to explain the progression of kidney disease. Uh, and the, the theory uh, begins with the reduction in nephron mass or a reduction in nephron number. And what that leads to is the uh, increase in filtration in the glomeruli of the remaining nephrons. It causes a hyperfiltration. And uh, that's probably at part, in part driven by an increase in glomerular filtration pressure and can be seen histologically or pathologically at, as a glomerular enlargement or increased size of the, of the glomerulus. Now, what seems to be a, a nice compensa compensatory adaptive response to return uh, renal function back to its original state ends up really being a maladaptive response. So, and, and that's the theory. Um, so that hyperfiltration then leads to sclerosis or fibrosis of of uh, glomeruli, further reduction in nephron mass, nephron number. And the consequences of that uh, over time uh, is uh, systemic hypertension, proteinuria or albuminuria, 
and later a decline in, in GFR. I also wanted to uh, briefly give you the updated um, definition of chronic kidney disease. So uh, chronic kidney disease is defined as abnormalities of kidney structure or function present for greater than three years with implications for, for health. Um, and it really does not take much to meet the criteria for chronic kidney disease. Um, so the criteria for CKD, either of the following present for greater than three months, markers of kidney damage, one or more. One is albuminuria, an uh, albumin to creatinine ratio of greater than or equal to 30 milligrams per gram of creatinine. Urinary sediment abnormalities. Electrolyte or other abnormalities due to tubular disorders. So this includes renal tubular acidosis, barter syndrome, and, and conditions such as that. Uh, abnormality is detected by histology, and that would be uh, chronic changes on uh, biopsy. Structural abnormality is detected by imaging. Uh, there's not too much that's excluded from that definition. The only exclusion that uh, is given is a solitary simple cyst um, in the kidney. Otherwise, uh, all the other structural abnormalities found on renal ultrasound are uh, considered in this category. Uh, history of uh, kidney transplantation, and then a decreased GFR of less than 60 mils per 1.73 meters square. So uh, the chronic kidney disease can be uh, classified or further subclassified based on the degree of renal failure, the GFR, and the amount of proteinuria with higher amounts of proteinuria giving you a higher risk for progressive uh, kidney disease. So nephron number is really a product of the nephron endowment, the number of nephrons you're born with, and the loss of nephrons over time due to disease or to aging, and I'll talk about aging in a second. So one of the more remarkable uh, findings about nephron endow endowment is the wide variation in number of nephrons in, in, from individual to individual. And we really have a very, very rudimentary understanding of that. And it, it really must boil down to two things, kind of the, the environment during development of the kidney, during nephron formation, and then the uh, genetic um, uh, constitution. So I, I mentioned that the, there is a wide uh, variation in number of nephrons, and, and it varies by almost one order of magnitude um, from individual to individual. Uh, with a mean number of being 870,582, if you like exact numbers. Um, so notice that uh, this study was uh, really spearheaded or out of Australia, and it, it included a population uh, from an ab aboriginal community where there's a high rate of end-stage renal failure, uh, where there's poor, uh, low socioeconomic status, and where there's uh, for prenatal care. Uh, and in addition to the wide uh, range and number of nephrons, there's also a wide range in the size of the, of the glomeruli. So again, uh, back to uh, one of the earlier slides, the size of a glomerulus is used to, um, as a marker of this hyperfiltration, this maladaptation to a low number. So uh, when is renal development vulnerable to potential insults um, that might change the developmental program? So this was work done a long time ago by Edith Potter, and I trust that that name rings a bell with uh, many people. So she found that um, nephron production uh, was still <coughs> occurring in most uh, fetuses before the age of uh, 34 weeks. So there was a nephrogenic zone that was present uh, before 34 uh, weeks gestation. After 30, 34 weeks or 35 weeks and beyond, uh, that uh, zone of nephrogenesis um, declined. Now, I think probably a better question than that to ask is when are most of the nephrons being made? And at least according to this analysis, most of the nephrons are being made between 25 and 35 weeks gestation. So that for most of the fetal development, and I would say also embryonic development, uh, the nephron 
production is, is at risk uh, from any kind of environmental changes. So what happens uh, over time to uh, kidney function and uh, nephron number? So this has been known for many years that as you age, your kidney function declines, even uh, in healthy individuals. So I know this is small, so this is age 50 and age 60 right in here for men and the same for women. So there's a decline in, in renal function. And along with that, there's a decline in, in functional nephrons. And it appears to be uh, maybe two processes at work. One is uh, sclerosis of the, of the glomeruli. So um, in the dark part of the bars is the increasing number of sclerotic glomeruli in the kidney as you get older. But there's also a decrease in the total number of normal plus sclerotic uh, glomeruli. And, and the cause for that uh, really has not been investigated and, and the, the mechanisms unknown. Now this process is well known and it is taken into consideration uh, during our um, uh, evaluation of potential kidney donors so that if you're over a certain age, you're no longer considered a, a suitable candidate to donate a kidney to a child because of fear that it would not last as long. So along with uh, the uh, decrease in nephron number, there's also a decrease in podocyte number in the, in the glomeruli. So this is a stain of a glomerulus staining in green, the podocytes, which allows this group to count the number of podocytes. Um, and so first notice here on, on the left, they again measured the glomerular volume and they found in older adults that the volume was higher, again, higher than in younger adults, again, uh, signifying uh, a, um, uh, this maladaptive response in hyperfiltration. Uh, there is also a decrease in the number of podocytes in each of those glomeruli, meaning that there were fewer podocytes to stretch over an increased surface area. And again, I, this is, you probably consider this a, um, a senescence. So what are the consequences of having uh, a modest decrease in nephron number? Well, first is hypertension. So this was a study that was published many years ago where the investigators counted the nephrons uh, from postmortem uh, specimens from individuals who died from it from an accident. Um, and what they found, and what they found was that patients who had a history of hypertension or had evidence of hypertension, such as ventricular hypertrophy, had fewer nephrons than controls who were age matched gender matched and size matched. So there were fewer nephrons. Um, and on top of that, those nephrons were larger. Uh, there were fewer nephrons and they were larger, again, indicating this maladaptive response or hyperfiltration. <clears throat> so this uh, counting nephrons is very difficult. It's difficult to follow cohorts. Um, you know, you, you can't know the nephron number before uh, death right now. So um, another way to, to evaluate it would be to take advantage of a maybe an accident or uh, experiment of nature and follow patients who have only a single kidney. Uh, so this group uh, followed a group, uh, uh, a cohort over time and reported the um, really the survival curve without evidence of kidney disease, and kidney disease is defined as, as uh, proteinuria, albu albuminuria, hypertension, decreased renal function, and over time, there's a significant decline in those patients who remain free of, of evidence of kidney disease. Um, so who is at risk for having a low nephron endowment or low nephron number? And I alluded to this earlier when I talked about the aboriginal population. This was, again, work out of Australia. So there's a correlation between the, the nephron number and the and nephron number here and the birth weight with uh, lower birth rate, rate or lower birth weight um, 
patients having uh, fewer nephrons, fewer glomeruli compared to a larger um, uh, newborns. Um, and again, uh, the, the size of the glomeruli were larger for those who had fewer uh, glomeruli. And there's evidence of injury in this population of low birth weight patients as well, with, uh, as evidenced by or as indicated by the presence of albumin or protein in, in the urine. Now, one other uh, group of patients who I'm concerned about are, are patients who are born prematurely. And I showed you earlier that the, the time when most of the nephrons are being made in a 25 to 35 week gestation period. Uh, this group uh, examined uh, um, uh, postmortem specimens of patients at or patients at a um, postconceptional age. So there were two groups. They were born at the same time. One, they were they had the same postconceptional age. One group was born stillborn, and the other book was born a few weeks ahead of time, and uh, but they had the same post-conceptional age. And what they found was those who were uh, born and then survived for a couple weeks had a, a smaller nephrogenic zone in the kidney than, their, uh, than the um, controls who had the same post-conceptional age. And most people, I think, would look at this and say, well, these patients or these infants were born, there was injury involved um, that, uh, that the nephrogenic zone disappeared because of an injury mechanism. However, what they found was that there was an accelerated maturation. So there was increased uh, glomerular generation uh, in those individuals who had been uh, born and then survived for a couple of weeks. And this is what they saw. So these are uh, two, from two different individuals who are, had the same post-conceptional age. This one was uh, stillborn, and you can see these immature forms of glomeruli uh, out at the periphery in the nephrogenic zone, whereas in this one, that nephrogenic zone is gone. And in addition to this finding, they, they also identified a lot of abnormal nephrons being formed. So uh, in conclusion, nephron endowment varies widely. The process of forming new nephrons is vulnerable to potential insults during most of fetal life. Renal development and nephron endowment is affected by fetal growth and uh, by premature birth. Nephrons are lost and renal function decreases during, during normal aging. A modest decrease in nephron number is associated with hypertension and evidence of renal injury. Thank you. Thanks very, thanks very much, Larry. Um, and our next speaker is Dr. Kritita Mistry, who will um, talk to us about uh, the latest in acute kidney injury. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to be talking about acute kidney injury. As you know, that means an acute or abrupt decline in renal function. So I wanted to start with what I want you to take home from this part of the talk. So number one is that acute kidney injury, or AKI, is common. It's common in both uh, critically ill and non-critically ill patients. It's associated with both increased mortality and increased length of stay. Um, acute kidney injury is also not well documented in the EMR and sometimes not recognized, and that impacts how we follow up uh, these patients. Uh, it has long-term consequences even if you recover from the episode of AKI, and so, and these long-term consequences include chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and proteinuria. And so what we want to try and focus on is to is prevention, early detection, and uh, intervention. So we see this a lot in, um, uh, you know, in, under various circumstances, the triple whammy that leads to renal injury. So let's talk about what AKI is. Like I said, it's an acute kind of reduction in renal function. 
Um, there are several, so I looked recently at just the literature to look at, you know, various papers in terms of how AKI is defined. And there are more than 30 different definitions of AKI depending on what paper you read. So these criteria were developed in order to standardize the, how people define AKI. The very first criteria was key, right? For most of these are not so much used in the clinical settings as more for clinical research. Um, so the RIFO criteria was the very first criteria that was developed to define acute kidney injury and, and various degrees of worsening acute kidney injuries. That was modified to pediatric RIFO criteria and the RIFO stands for risk injury failure loss and um, and say renal disease. So the um, these two, loss and end-stage renal disease, are outcome measures. The first three are acute kidney injury stages. Um, following that, the acute kidney injury network um, created some criteria that were different from the PRIFO criteria. These AKIM criteria were not really validated in children. And then most recently, we have these KDGO guidelines, and that's the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, uh, which are a combination of these two criteria to define acute kidney injury. You can see that, you know, the PRIFO criteria uses creatinine and calculating uh, creatinine clearance, whereas, you know, the acute kidney injury network criteria uses serum creatinine, and this uses a combination of both. The time frames are also a little different for the, the, the um, criteria. All of these, which is not on the slide, um, also include oliguria, so various degrees of oliguria in, in um, over a certain time frame. And the criteria for defining AKI can include either a reduction in the creatinine clearance for the serum creatinine or a degree of reduction in the urine output. So acute kidney injury in hospitals is common. It's more common in ICU, in the ICU setting. And the incidence is very, the range of incidence is very wide. The, the higher incidence uh, uh, occurs in sicker children who are critically ill and also in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. Um, overall, though, the incidence in the ICU looking at different studies using p rifle and Aiken criteria is about 40%. So in non-critically ill children, there are fewer studies that tell us what the incidence of AKI is. Um, most of the studies look at patients who are already at risk for AKI, so for example, patients who have had exposure to a nephrotoxin. And in these studies, you know, up to a third, or in this study, a fifth of patients, depending on what criteria are used, have acute kidney injury. So who's at risk? Um, the populations that are at risk are the preterm babies who have still developing nephrons, um, uh, those with congenital heart disease, specifically especially those undergoing cardiac surgery, and then the hemonc population. And the leading causes of AKI in patients in the hospital are hypoxia and ischemia, uh, sepsis, hypoperfusion, and cardiopulmonary bypass, cardiac surgery, and then nephrotoxins. So children with already underlying chronic kidney disease uh, are at higher risk of an acute injury. Younger children are also at higher risk compared to older children. And whereas previously, 
you know, having intrinsic renal disease was a big risk factor. It still is, but the etiology of the acute kidney injury has become increasing, in, increasingly more iatrogenic. And I think that's because more critically ill children are surviving uh, and, uh, uh, and we're doing more procedures. Um, so as a general rule, AKI, AKI is not good, it's bad. <laughs> and irrespective of other co-founding <coughs> factors, there are multiple studies that have shown in children that children's mortality and length of hospital stay is increased when you have acute kidney injury. So this, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This picture shows this quite nicely. So this looks at mortality in children. All the studies that I'm gonna show you are in children, but this shows uh, that compared to patients who don't have acute kidney injury, to patients who do, the mortality is firstly much higher in those who have acute kidney injury versus those who don't have acute kidney injury. And secondly, those with milder forms of acute kidney injury have a lower mortality compared to those who have failure or more severe acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury is also associated with as I said, mortality and length of stay. This was a study that was done using ICD-9 codes and was, you, and was a study that was done in both ICU and non-ICU patients. So in the study overall, um, patients with acute kidney injury had a higher mortality compared to patients who did not have acute kidney injury. Patients with acute kidney injury also had a higher, a longer length of hospital stay compared to patients who did not have acute kidney injury. Younger children are at higher risk. So neonates, patients under the age of one month who developed acute kidney injury had a much higher mortality compared to older children over the month of, over the age of one month, and similarly for length of stay. Patients who required dialysis during their acute, in, uh, acute kidney injury also had higher mortality and higher and a longer length of stay compared to those who did not require dialysis. And then ICU patients compared to non-critically ill patients had higher mortality and higher length of um, hospital stay. In patients, um, who had acute kidney injury compared to, so ICU patients compared to non-critically ill patients. Um, if you look at uh, mortality rates, so mortality rates go up with worsening uh, degrees of acute kidney injury in the ICU, but in the non-ICU setting, that was not found to be the case. However, in the non-ICU setting, length of stay increases with worsening degrees of acute kidney injury, and the same is true for ICU patients also. So one thing to keep in mind is the international classification of diseases, the code that we use to document uh, uh, illness in the hospital is not reflective of the two true incidents of acute kidney injury. And in this study, looking at this specifically in non-critically ill children receiving nephrotoxins, there were almost 60% more patients were classified as having acute kidney injury than if you just looked at the ICD-9 coding. Um, so what about the long-term consequences? So yes, these kids do have higher mortality, higher hospitalization, at least longer hospitalization. But what about the more longer-term consequences of acute kidney injury? 
So this retrospective analysis of 174 children with acute kidney injury, of which 126 survived, showed that if you have underlying urologic or kidney disease, then your renal survival was much lower than if you didn't have underlying or, or renal or urologic disease. Um, and then there were probably only about a quarter of patients in this study that were followed up like three to five years. And in that three to five year follow-up period, uh, uh, about 60% have some evidence of uh, chronic kidney disease. Only about a third of them were actually followed by a pediatric nephrologist. This was a prospective study which was uh, had a one to three year follow up of 120 patients, and these patients did not have a history of renal disease. About 10% of them had proteinuria and a GFR that was moderately decreased to less than 60, and almost half of them had evidence of chronic kidney disease and a milder degree of chronic kidney disease, so hyperfiltration proteinuria. There was a trend towards the more severe forms of kidney injury, uh, having more CKD or chronic kidney disease, but that wasn't statistically significant. And in this study, patients who needed renal replacement therapy or dialysis um, had significantly more chronic kidney disease. Um, this was another study looking at long-term outcomes in patients with acute kidney injury who were getting nephrotoxins. And at six months of follow-up, there were 80 patients of the 100 initially enrolled who were still being followed up. And only about 20%, less than 20% were being seen by a nephrologist. Three quarters, so three or four who required renal replacement therapy died. And this is just to show you that of those patients, however you measure GFR, those patients who did have acute kidney injury, no matter how you measured it, and creatinine had lower creatinine clearances compared to patients who did not have um, acute kidney injury. So creatinine clearances were significantly lower, and markers for chronic kidney disease were also higher in patients who had the acute kidney injury versus those that did not. So next step, we want to prevent acute kidney injury and we, we want to identify it early and also intervene early. There's several trials underway, but there's nothing significant to report as yet about that. Um, there's a, you know, the hot thing is to find a reliable biomarker. So serum creatinine is not a good biomarker for kidney disease. Your GFR is very significantly reduced by the time your serum creatinine goes up. And so what we want to find is kind of an equivalent of, say, troponin to measure myocardial insult, so a similar biomarker that's reliable, sensitive, specific to measure acute kidney injury. And it may be that that's going to be a, a, some sort of a composite of different markers. Uh, also using our EMR to identify acute kidney injury more effectively and earlier. So thank you, happy World Kidney Day. We want to try and avoid renal insults because they lead to long-term renal damage and increased mortality, and I think this is important. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mistry. <clears throat> Dr. Sunyan An will now talk about um, hypertension, um, which is a significant issue in childhood and sets up um, issues for um, uh, later adult disease. Sunyan? Thank you, Lisa. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I will be talking about hypertension, uh, which is a growing and very serious problem in children. So hypertension is second to only asthma and obesity and prevalence of chronic diseases in childhood. In the 1970s and 1980s, 0.3 to 1.2 percent of children had hypertension. Currently, this number is much higher. So now, 3 to 5 percent of all children have hypertension, 
and 3 to 24 percent of all children are prehypertensive. This prevalence is much higher in obese children, so 20 to 47 percent of obese children are hypertensive. And the prevalence of hypertension in children increases with increasing BMI percentile. Now, this increasing prevalence of hypertension has been linked to obesity, high salt food intake, and a sedentary lifestyle. Could these numbers be higher? Absolutely. Are we underestimating the prevalence of hypertension? Most probably so. So providers don't routinely measure blood pressure. And in a survey of pediatricians in the U.S., around 40% of pediatricians said that they do not routinely measure blood pressures. Also, providers don't routinely recognize blood pressure elevation. So as I mentioned earlier, hypertension is more prevalent in obese children. And so um, the prevalence of obesity in 2 to 19-year-old uh, patients remains high at 17% based on the National Health and a Nutrition uh, Examination Survey data. Obstructive sleep apnea is very common in obese children, and this has been independently linked to hypertension. There are various theories as to how obesity leads to hypertension. <clears throat> One is that the dysfunctional adipocyte uh, results in an imbalance in expression of pro- and anti-inflammatory adipokines. And these adipokines include uh, leptin, um, and they also hypothesize that the dysfunctional adipocyte results in increased um, renin uh, secretion, which results in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation. Um, and there's also uh, theories that there's activation of the sympathetic nervous system in obese patients that leads to um, hypertension. So why is identifying and controlling hypertension so important? Pediatric hypertension correlates to hypertension in adulthood. Childhood hypertension is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease in adults. And according to the WHO, poor blood pressure control is the number one attributable risk of death in the world. So it accounts for 62% uh, of cerebrovascular disease and 49% of ischemic heart disease in adults. So following are the various stages of hypertension. Um, the percentiles, the blood pressure percentiles here are based on age, gender, and height. So in patients 1 to 17 years of age, a normal blood pressure is less than the 90th percentile. Um, Prehypertension is defined as blood pressure percentiles between the 90th to the 95th percentile, or a blood pressure greater than 120 over 80, regardless of the 95th percentile. Stage 1 hypertension is defined as blood pressures between the 95th to 99th percentile plus 5 millimercuries, and stage 2 hypertension is defined as blood pressure percentiles greater than the 99th percentile plus 5 millimercuries. In, in, in individuals greater than 18 years old, so um, adult patients, uh, a normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Uh, Prehypertension is defined as 120 to 139 over 80 to 89 millimercuries. Uh, stage 1 hypertension is defined as 140 to 159 over 90 to 99 millimercuries, and stage 2 hypertension is defined as 160 over 160 to 100 millimercuries. So blood pressure measurement is extremely important, and this is very challenging in pediatric patients, as you probably all have experienced. So the technique is extremely important in blood pressure measurement. Uh, the patient should rest for at least five minutes before the blood pressure measurement and should be sitting in an upright position or for younger children lying down. Now, the blood pressure readings from the leg are usually 10 to 20 millimercuries higher than those from the arm. And so for those of you who have consulted us, which is probably the majority in this uh, room, um, we, you note that we usually insist on taking arm blood pressure measurements uh, precisely for this reason. So I brought here an example of a blood pressure cuff but the width of the cuff bladder or the part that inflates should be at least 40% of the mid-arm circumference, and the bladder length should wrap around at least 80 to 100% of the uh, upper arm circumference. And then factors that affect blood pressure measurement include talking, which increases the blood pressure by 7 to 10 millimercuries, 
And those of you who have crossed legs today, your blood pressures are going to be two to eight millimercuries higher than if you don't cross your legs. Um, <laughs> lean back on your chairs because no back support increases your blood pressure by six to ten millimercuries, so relax. And then um, a frequent error that we encounter is using a cuff that is too small. So if you use a cuff that is too small, your systolic blood pressure can be 10 millimercuries higher than it actually is. So we frequently see white coat and mass hypertension in children. And so what is white coat hypertension? White coat hypertension refers to blood pressures greater than the 95th percentile in the physician's office and blood pressures below the 95th percentile outside the physician's office. So it's very important to detect white coat hypertension, especially in children. <laughs> Mass hypertension refers to normal blood pressures in the physician's office and elevated blood pressures outside of the office. Um, and um, you'll be surprised by this, but we frequently see this, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease. So both white coat and mass hypertension have been linked to increased cardiovascular risk in adults and mass hypertension has been associated with left ventricular hypertrophy in children. So we usually detect white coat and mass hypertension by using 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So following are the tests uh, that need to be taken when a patient is suspected um, to have hypertension. A careful history taking is very important. So you want to take the sleep history. Um, as I mentioned earlier, obstructive sleep apnea is linked to hypertension. Family history is important. Uh, risk factor detection. Um, and then you want to know about dietary um, uh, habits and habits such as smoking. A physical examination is also very important. Now, for blood tests, we usually send for a CBC. Um, anemia usually can indicate uh, chronic kidney disease, or if you've got an elevated hematocrit, that could indicate polycythemia, which is linked to hypertension. Uh, you would also want to send for electrolytes and a BUN and creatinine to uh, detect uh, renal dysfunction. And a plasma renin and aldosterone should also be sent to screen for renal and mineral corticoid disorders. Now, of course, you would want to send a urinalysis to detect hematuria or proteinuria. And if you have tachycardia or diaphoresis present in the patient, uh, you would want to send thyroid function tests or urine catecholamine. And then a renal ultrasound should be performed to detect structural renal anomalies. So in prehypertensive obese patients, and in all patients with blood pressure percentiles greater than the 95th percentile, in patients with a family history of hypertension or cardiovascular disease, or in a child with chronic renal disease, you will want to send a fasting lipid panel and a fasting glucose level. In those who you suspect substance or drug abuse, you would want to do a drug screen. And you should also do an echocardiogram to <coughs> assess for end uh, organ damage, uh, specifically left ventricular hypertrophy. And the echocardiogram can also screen for congenital heart anomalies. A retinal exam during your physical exam is also important to detect um, hypertensive changes in the retina, including uh, copper wiring or AV nicking. So the treatment for hypertension can be largely divided into pharmacological and non-pharmacological measures. So in children with prehypertension and no end organ target damage, uh, you can do lifestyle modifications that include weight reduction and dietary changes. So children should devote at least 30 to 60 minutes daily to exercise, and they should reduce their sedentary activities. So exercise here does not refer to using your fingers to text or do video games. Um, it actually means physical exercise that increases your pulse rate. And in a study of European adolescents, it has been shown that greater than 60 minutes per day of exercise was able to attenuate the um, deleterious effect of genetic polymorphisms on systolic blood pressure. So that's how important exercise is. Um, as you know, dietary modifications are also very important. Uh, salt restriction results in immediate falls in blood pressure in children. And the current recommendations are to restrict sodium to less than 1.2 grams per day for four to eight-year-old children, and 1.5 grams per day for children uh, older than nine years of age. Now, a lot of you have heard of the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is a diet rich in vegetables, fruits, and low-fat dairy products. So the DASH diet is um, rich in calcium, potassium, and magnesium, 
and these elements have been associated with decreased blood pressures. Now, um, what are the indications for starting medication? And we um, get asked this question frequently. The indications are essential hypertension that has persisted beyond six months despite lifestyle modifications, the presence of secondary hypertension, <coughs> evidence of end organ damage, symptomatic hypertension, stage two hypertension, and diabetes. And the following article, uh, the expert panel on integrated guidelines for cardiovascular health and risk reduction in children and adolescents, a summary report that was published in Pediatrics, is um, a publication that provides comprehensive tables regarding antihypertensive medications in children. So you may want to refer to this. It's a very comprehensive, nice guideline that shows basically uh, the drug name, the class of the drug, uh, the initial dose, the maximal dose, the dosing interval and comments regarding the, uh, the drug. And it also lets you know whether it's FDA approved or not. So finally, what are the goals of therapy for hypertension? Number one, we want to reduce the blood pressure below the 90th percentile for children with secondary hypertension or end organ target damage. And we want to reduce the blood pressure below the 95th percentile for children with essential hypertension and no end organ target damage. Now, in cases where the hypertension improves due to either lifestyle modification or improvement in the disease causing the hypertension, the medication can be gradually weaned and eventually stopped. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Yang. Okay, so um, now Dr. Shamir uh, Tuckman is going to um, summarize this talk. I want to point out to the residents in the audience, because I know you're now all agog about how cool the kidney is and how important dealing with kidney disease is, now that you understand it. And so Shamir is going to take us through a summary, but this is the man to besiege with your fellowship applications. <laughs> That was an unpaid advertisement. Honey, but, but we're in the same club. But appreciated. So my role um, in this talk is to provide a brief summary of what you just heard and then open up the floor for uh, questions from the audience. So um, nephron endowment, um, as we learned, is a really important determinant of a future risk of chronic kidney disease and is associated with uh, comorbidities such as hypertension. Uh, primary risk factors that we often encounter uh, in children include low birth weight and prematurity. Acute kidney injury is common in both the ICU and non-ICU settings. Uh, it's associated with uh, certainly an increased length of stay in both groups and with mortality in the ICU population. And it's often under-recognized under and not documented properly, which may impact subsequent follow-up of these children. AKI has potential long-term consequences that include chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and proteinuria, and hence very important to focus on its prevention, early identification, and interventions that may uh, stem that. Uh, pediatric and young adult hypertension has been a growing national and international public health issue. The causes are multifactorial, but include both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Hypertension in kids is likely under-recognized due to the infrequent and proper blood pressure measurement, and appropriate lifestyle modifications and pharmacological therapy are key to limiting the long-term health effects of pediatric hypertension. So with that, I'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. Oh, let me. <laughs> Professor Summer. <laughs> Professor Teach. Um, this was a great presentation. Um, I'll just get it well. Uh, it's on. It's on. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, I'm not going to go back and do a um, fellowship at this point. My coach. Genetics, obviously, is something that's coming more and more to the front, particularly for the hypersensitive type patients. Looking for where do you see the role of screening for some data from that, here's data with intensity, things like that. How is that starting to work into your evaluation? So, Marshall, you bring up a very important point. Um, the diagnosis of potential monogenetic causes of pediatric hypertension is very important. 
not just because often those children have very significant and severe hypertension, but the treatment for those conditions is, can be radically different in terms of the pharmacological therapy you use. So one of the reasons I personally um, send off uh, plasma renin activity on aldosterone levels is not so much to detect elevated levels, which have a fairly poor sensitivity in identifying kids with a vascular cause of hypertension or renovascular hypertension. It's really to identify the children with low renin and aldosterone levels that might point to a monogenetic disorder being present. It's in those cases that, you know, the help of our genetics colleagues is key um, in identifying potential uh, mutations that would lead to a diagnosis or for us to conduct further testing that would help pinpoint a monogenetic cause of disease. In general, the younger the child is when they're diagnosed with hypertension and the more severe the hypertension is, the more likely you're going to be dealing uh, in the realm of monogenetic hypertension. Shamir and group, I really wanted to uh, compliment you on a great, great presentation. I do have two questions, one's simple and one's a little bit more involved. Since we have two kidneys, shouldn't we be celebrating world kidneys? Okay. So I'll answer your first question first. Um, there are people walking around with one kidney that don't even know it. So we wanted to be inclusive of everybody, just in case you were missing one. We didn't want anyone to feel bad. <laughs> Okay, fair, fair enough. Maybe we could put parens with an S. <laughs> my, my real question is, in, in my world, in the emergency department, we um, get blood pressures on um, virtually everybody who comes in the door, and, and uh, the measurements, as you might imagine, are, are not uh, exceedingly high quality much of the time. But what we do detect, the most common scenario we detect is, is prehypertension or hypertension in um, adolescents with uh, very high BMI. And, and pre-adolescents with very high BMI. And this is, this is a daily occurrence over and over again. And I make note of it, uh, you know, ask about headaches and, 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 you know, obvious things to ask about. But uh, my typical response, and I think that of much of my colleagues, is, is to draw to the family's attention, suggest uh, the obvious lifestyle modifications. But when I was looking at that long list of, of, of things that uh, you would recommend uh, doing, I was thinking, boy, we could really overwhelm the medical system by referring you all these patients or starting these workups or suggesting that primary care providers. So, so how do you triage that situation where most likely so much of it is due to the high BMI? Do they really need that extensive workup at that time? So as you know, the ER is a special setting in the hospital. Um, if you look at the fourth report on pediatric hypertension, hypertension cannot be diagnosed in most kids with a single blood pressure measurement. You have to have a minimum of three elevated blood pressure measurements done on three separate occasions. Taking blood pressures is both a skill and an art. And uh, you can imagine in an emergency room setting, many patients, especially teenagers, may be a bit anxious. So I guess it kind of behooves us to make sure that these patients with increased BMI and obesity get followed up by their pediatricians, have their blood pressures measured in a calm atmosphere, and with the appropriately sized cuff. Obviously, cuff size becomes a huge issue, uh, pardon the pun, in overweight patients. And if you rather upsize your cuff as opposed to downsize in terms of obtaining an accurate blood pressure. So, I recognize what you're saying. I, I do think those patients do require follow-up and at least two more blood pressure measurements, and if should they remain elevated, uh, probably need to come see us in nephrology. Okay. So I can only, 
I'll let my colleagues answer as well. I'll speak for myself in terms of why I went into pediatric nephrology and why I think it's such a wonderful subspecialty to go into. Um, the first is that in pediatric nephrology, um, you have all the benefits of continuity as a primary care provider would get with the added you know, benefits of being in a subspecialty that is fairly and highly academic, that values research, um, and that has um, special roles in all, you know, pediatric hospitals. So many of our patients, we get to know from the time they may be preterm infants in the NICU, and if we're lucky and are able to keep them healthy, we may follow them until they're 21 or, 20 or 24 years or older, and often see them on a regular basis every one, two, three, or four months. And so we get to know them as a primary care provider, we'll get to know their patients. The other is that it's a highly academic field and a relatively small field. There's about 400 to 600 pediatric nephrologists nationally. We consider ourselves a family and we all know each other and work together and collaborate together on research. It's a field that values research and always has. And uh, I feel that in nephrology, I always got a very, very strong grounding in not just renal physiology, but overall physiology. And for me, that was the, that was the draw of the field. Um, I let my colleagues answer for themselves if they if they have anything to add. Uh, I want to thank all my colleagues for this excellent presentation, and want to thank Mary for advertising our field. So, as Shamir said, we are 600 of us, and many of them are near the end of their career. So, we are the most age the population, if you will. So there is a room for us to grow. It's an exciting field. I went into nephrology for the same reasons. It's academically stimulating. It's challenge it's challenging field. We know our patients from inside out. Some of them we meet during fetal consults and we follow them until they're twenty two years of age through their dialysis, transplant, and thereafter. So any youngsters who are really interested. Email me or call. Email me or call. <laughs> I, and for all the students and the residents out there, it's the coolest field ever. <laughs> I just want to tell you that the kidneys are dynamic. It's so fun. It's never boring. It's a great field. <laughs> So if I just had one question about, um, you didn't talk at all about racial differences, and I've worked with the HIV adolescent population for a number of years, and we know from the HIV epidemic that African Americans are more at risk for damage to the kidneys, both from HIV disease and also from the medications that are prescribed to treat HIV disease. Um, so I'd like one, any comments around um, the racial vulnerability, and then secondly, if you've had any thoughts about uh, prescribing PrEP, which are um, is um, HIV medications that a person would take to prevent HIV disease, which is being recommended for adolescents and young adults, who and those most at risk are actually African American young men who have sex with men, potentially put, putting them at risk for kidney disease. So I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Sure. So um, so there are certain and definite. Um, disparities in the occurrence of not just kidney disease, but also associated comorbidities such as hypertension uh, between different racial groups. Uh, believe it or not, there's not a whole lot of data in terms of what Dr. Patterson talked about in terms of nephron endowment between uh, different racial groups. There was a study done out of the southeastern United States where they looked at African American and Caucasian adults with, with and without hypertension. And there was not a really big difference in baseline nephron endowment between um, non-hypertensive African Americans and Caucasians, although Caucasians with hypertension had a much more significant decline in nephron endowment compared to African Americans. That getting back to your question about HIV, you know, HIV nephropathy is um, an important cause of chronic kidney disease, especially in adolescents who then go into adulthood. Now, the medications used to treat HIV also have some nephrotoxic potential, but looking at the risks and benefits of both, well-controlled HIV is probably the best way to prevent 
HIV nephropathy, keeping viral loads at a minimum or undetectable. In terms of the risk benefit of PrEP regimens to, to prevent HIV, I think that has to be taken on a, um, I guess, a case by case basis based on the baseline risk in a community and the risk of the comorbidities associated with HIV, HIV nephropathy just being one of them in particular. Make a comment. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is manifold more common in African American population. And APOL1 is one of the genetic uh, polymorphism being associated with that. HIV associated nephropathy is also, you know, people are studying the role of APOL1, which is much more common in African Americans. So I think there's a lot more to learn. Definitely chronic kidney disease and stage renal disease is more common in African American population. And we see that on our, our practice. Thank you. Thank you.